Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see everyone out this beautiful Sunday in July. Um, I know summer basically just started, but it feels like it's almost over, which is so sad to me. Um, I know, and maybe I'm just thinking of the glass half empty, but man, I'm enjoying the weather. I'm enjoying uh, the time outside. Um, Jane and I, my daughter Jane and I went camping this week, which I shared a little bit last week, was our first time camping, and we had a really, really good time. We when swimming, the, the campground we went to stay at has a, has a pool, and we went to the lake and went to a drive-in movie theater. If, if you don't know what that is, you drive in and watch a movie. <laughs> uh, you drive with your car, and you put it on the radio, and you watch a movie. It was awesome. Jane stayed up way past her bedtime every single night, but it was absolutely incredible. I want to encourage you uh, to take some time away uh, this summer with your family uh, to, to connect. I know I've been telling you that uh, for weeks now, but I think it's really important for us to connect. Um, this summer. Now, Jane, uh, one thing that I noticed while we were camping is that Jane loves to ask questions. Um, if you have toddlers around or maybe you have someone in your life where their favorite thing to do is ask questions, uh, it can be easy to get sick of the questions that our kids are asking us. Uh, so Jane, the one, the one question she loves asking, you know this question is why, right? Why? And it was, uh, I think it was uh, last night, uh, or Friday night, I was telling Jane before bed, I said, hey, by the way, uh, mom works tomorrow, so it's just going to be you, me, and Marin during the day. Mom's got to work. And she's like, why? I'm like, that's actually a tough question, right? Because there's a lot of depth to the why. But I just was like, in the moment, I was like, well, so that, we, so that way we can eat. And she's like, why do we have to eat? And I'm like, well... It's getting more complicated as the questions go, but really simply, we need energy to to live. She's like, why do we need energy? I'm like, so we can move our arms and so we can walk. And that satisfied her her question of why, right? She loves to ask why. And today I want to start a new series called uh, The Questions God Asks Us. I think sometimes as Christians, we're very good as believers or people who pray. We're very good at asking God questions, right? We're, we're, we're very good at asking God why or very good at asking God, you know, all the questions we have in our minds. We like to answer the questions we have. There's so many ministries dedicated to answering the questions that we have as Christians and we have as people of why is this and how did this happen? And we like to understand it. But I think sometimes when we're asking all the questions, we forget that sometimes God is asking us questions too. That throughout scripture, there's moments where God asks questions of his followers or God asks questions of his people and God asks questions of of, of the people throughout scripture. There's so many moments. And so this summer, we're going to go through seven questions that God asks us, seven different questions throughout Scripture that God asks of us that he asked in Scripture. And the first question that God asks us throughout Scripture comes in Genesis. It comes right after the serpent has convinced Eve to eat the fruit, and then in turn, she convinces Adam to eat the fruit. Maybe you know the story. And they, they, they did the one thing that God told them not to do. They had a million things they could do, but of course they chose the one thing they couldn't do. Does that remind you of anybody? Yourself, right? Remind you of me, you know, I choose the one thing I shouldn't do over the millions of things I should do. And so I find it so funny even when we ask kids, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? There's so many things that they could be, millions of things. And we're so, oftentimes, we're so concerned about what does God want for me to do? And I think sometimes he's like, the door's open, but just not this one thing. (laughs) There's all these options. Just go do something. Don't just sit back and wait for something to happen to us. He's like, there's a lot of things. Go do something. Go do something that you see in front of you. So we can read this, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Again, this is right after the serpent has convinced Eve to eat the fruit and then Adam And verse seven says this, at that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. 
So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to to the man, where are you? Where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. This is the first question God asks when we read through scripture. The first question humanity is asked by God is this, is where are you? It's a big question. Where are you? Where have you gone? A question that comes after God isn't seeing them doing their normal activities now. Of course he knew. He looks about in the garden. There's no Adam, there's no Eve. Where'd they go? Where, where, where are you? Now, of course, he knew what had happened. He wasn't shocked when he went in the garden. He was like, uh-oh, where'd my creation go? He didn't walk in and be like, ah, Adam, you got lost again, right? He, he knew what was happening. He knew the answer to this question. But see, Adam and Eve feel their first painful emotion, which is shame. See, the first emotion, the first thing felt when their eyes were opened was shame. Shame based on what they had done. Shame based on what they had done. And so what they did is they did the one thing they weren't supposed to do and they knew what they weren't supposed to do. They did it anyway and all of a sudden they feel shame because they're naked. So what do they do? They try and hide from God. They try to cover themselves up and hide from the one who created them and the one who loved them. I think it's the same feeling we get when we mess up. The same feeling we get when we don't want people to know. We try and hide it. We try and hide ourselves. We try and run away from the feeling of discomfort. We want to be comfortable. And being vulnerable can, be, can seem painful and scary. We might try and hide our failure. We might try and hide our sin from people or from God. We don't want them to know, so we try and hide. We try and hide the evidence Try and pretend like nothing's going on. Blame other people for our problems. You ever see this? You notice how kids are always blaming each other for when something goes wrong? One thing that's really funny that Jane does is, it, is she, she loves to write her name, J-A-N-E, and she can do it pretty well. It's, you can tell she wrote it, though. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's not me who wrote it. The other day, we went into a room, and we looked behind her door, and someone had drawn on our wall with a pen. And, and in, the, in the art was J-A-N-E. She left her own like sign, this I did this. Like when an artist signs their name or an artist hides something in their art, Jane wrote J-A-N-E. And the worst, the funniest part is that she didn't even try and hide the pen. It's just sitting on the ground right in front of where she wrote. And we're like, Jane, who did this? Right? That was the question. It's similar. Where are you? Who did this? She's like... It was me. I'm like, thank you for telling the truth. Now, getting pen out of a wall is not easy, and it leaves um, lines, right? Because it's a, it's a pen. But God approaches their shame in a unique way. I, I think we can learn from this way to approach it, and how God approaches us is he knows the answer to the question, where are you? He isn't in the garden being like, hmm, is this the wrong garden? Didn't I just create two people to live here? Where did Adam go? Where is Eve? Hello, right? He knew the answer to the question. He knew what they had done. Yet he doesn't approach them immediately with anger and wrath. He asks them the simple question, where are you? A question that's filled with love and grace that God pours out on us daily. Where are you? So why did God ask the question if he already knew the answer? See, I think the question was designed to pull Adam and Eve out of hiding and pull them out of shame back into connection. A question that wasn't filled with anger, but with the intent of pulling them out of the situation they had created. So maybe God is asking us or asking you or asking me the same question today, where are you? What are we hiding from or what are we hiding for? See, I think shame is 
and sin is often why we hide. We, why we try our hardest not to be seen, not to be noticed. It's like playing a big game of hide and seek. We sin and then we run away and hide and hope God can't find us. But I think we already know God will find us. He already knows where we are. It's like when you play hide and seek with a child and they hide under the table in plain sight. It's like I know exactly where you went. But then when I hide, I have to start making noises and basically telling Jane where I am because I'm pretty good at hiding. But God knows where we are. He knows where we've gone. We can never run too far away. We can never go too far down the valley or too high up the mountain for him to not find us and not see us and not know where we are because we would rather, though, be, not be noticed. We would rather not be fully seen. We would rather not be vulnerable. We might be hiding because of sin. It could be an addiction. It could be a habit that we can't seem to break in our life. So we sin in private and no one knows. We're hiding parts of our story for fear of rejection, fear of not being loved, or fear of no longer belonging. I think one of the hardest things about hidden sin is that we feel that if we let somebody know, if we tell our spouse, if we tell somebody, that's going to be the end of relationship and that's going to be the end of connection. That's going to be the end of being loved and belonging. See, we might feel hopelessly lost. We might feel like we've lost our way. We might feel that there's no turning back. We've gone too far. We, we may feel our actions have caused us to lose connection with the people we love and admire and care about the most. We feel as if the world is against us and no one could love us anymore. Now, I know these feelings because I've experienced them before. The thought of how could somebody love me if they only knew my story. If this someone only knew my story, then I wouldn't be able to belong anymore. But the beauty is that God is always there and always loves you. Even if he's the only one, his love is enough. He's asking this question, where are you? in a way of bringing us back or aligning us, bringing us back to where we're supposed to be. Because when we're hiding, we're not where we're supposed to be. Jesus, Jesus summed up his ministry in Luke chapter 19 after a conversation he has with Zacchaeus. It says this, for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. A summarization of Jesus' mission or call was to seek and save the lost. Seek and save. See, Adam and, Adam and Eve had created space for shame to come. A space where sin entered the human story, where human connection was hard to find. And human connection, in fact, they hid themselves from each other. Even though they were one, they hid themselves from each other because they were ashamed, where they were ashamed because they were naked. Where intimacy was crushed and replaced with hiding. And I think as humanity, ever since we've been hiding, we've been filled with shame. Shame because of the things we've done and shame because of the thoughts we've had and shame because of how we've treated one another. That shame has almost taken over our life and taken over our story. Author Brene Brown defines shame as this, the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. I don't know anybody in my life who's never experienced this. Never experienced a place where we believe we're flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. And you know what's painful about this is that some of us were stuck in this. We've let shame take over our whole life. We've let shame come in and we just feel guilt. We just feel shameful for all the things we've done and all the things we've said and all the thoughts we've had. And we all have moments, right, where we mess up bad. And shame comes. This is exactly what Adam and Eve were experiencing in the garden. You know what they thought? They thought that they had lost their ability to be loved by God. 
And they, in fact, they thought they had lost their ability to belong. See, God wants to conquer this feeling in our lives. In fact, ever since this moment, if you read through the Bible, it's a redemption story of God trying to get us back. And then when Jesus came and went to the cross and died, it had happened. He'd, he'd created a way for us to come back where shame can disappear from our lives. See, when we sin, our first response is often to run away from him rather than run toward him. See, sin in itself pushes us away from God, but he doesn't want us to hide from him. He wants us to connect to him, which is the safest and best place we can be, a place of forgiveness, a place of safety a place where we can be forgiven, a place where we can experience unconditional love, a space where there's no condemnation. And this is exactly what Paul said when he wrote his letter to the church in Rome in Romans chapter eight, verse one to four. It says this, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could, what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. This is a powerful four verses. In fact, this is four verses that can change our life. Four verses that maybe we've read before, but we have a hard time believing. No condemnation. Does God know my story? Does God know what I've done? Does God know what I've said? Does God know what goes on in my mind? The answer is yes, but he still approaches us and says, where are you? Where are you? There's no condemnation. We are freed from the power of sin. The law couldn't save us because of how weak and sinful we are. So God sent Jesus so that we don't have to be led by our sinful nature, but we can be led by the Spirit. This can change our lives. I think these are some of the most important verses we have in regards to the beauty of what Jesus did for us and how God sees us. I think oftentimes our shame comes when our identity is in our sin rather than in our Savior. We believe, okay, because I sinned, that makes me a horrible, flawed person, which the answer is it's true. But through Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. And then Paul later, you know, he says, should I keep on sinning because of grace? And he says, by no means. You better not, you know. But grace is sufficient for us. We let it go and we allow him to take us and forgive us. We don't have to hide anymore. We don't have to let sin and shame control us, but rather let Holy Spirit lead us and guide us. See, the greatest leader we have is not our sin. Yet a lot of us, we're letting our sin lead us. But our helper, our advocate, the Holy Spirit, needs to be our guide. I mean, see what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in, in John 14, verse 26. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. I'm gonna invite up uh, Micah to come. See, the Holy Spirit will teach us Teach us and remind us. Teach us how to live and teach us where to go and show us how to not stay in hiding but to live free and live in the light. See, the question, where are you, what does it do with combat shame? It combat shame, it says, hey, come out of the darkness, bring it into the light and let me love you is what God is saying to us. Where are you? 
I think some of us, we've been hiding for so long. We've let shame control us and we let our sin lead us. And God is saying, hey, where are you? Come on back. Come back to where you're supposed to be. This question, where are you, pulls us out of hiding and into deep connection again. The connection that we feel we lost because of our mistakes and because of our sin. The connection we feel we broke because of our sin. See, God is in the business of seeking and saving. He will find us even if we have a really good hiding spot. Even if we're the hide and seek champion, he will find us. No matter where you go, he will find you. Because he loves you. He cares about you. See, we weren't designed to live with shame. We weren't designed to live alone. We weren't designed to hide we were designed to live. We were designed at the beginning to be open and transparent and vulnerable. And over time, we've lost our ability to trust and we've lost our ability to be honest and we've lost our ability to love and we, we've lost our ability. And God says, where are you? God, a question that God might be asking you even this morning is, where are you? It might be your time to come out of hiding and to, to let go of shame and to hold on to grace. Time to come out of the shadows and step into the light. Time to let grace wash us clean by the blood of the Lamb. We sing about it earlier that we aren't enough unless He comes. And He wants to come and meet us. He wants to meet us where we are. But we have to be willing to come out of hiding. We need to be vulnerable and we need to be transparent. We need to be willing to admit when we are wrong and to seek forgiveness and allow grace to come and let shame leave. That even in our transgressions, God still loves us because what if Jesus did for us? See, God asks us, where are you? Not to bring shame, but to defeat shame. To bring us back to connection. To bring us to vulnerability and transparency. To bring the dark things in our lives, bring it into the light. See, this call, where are you, is a call to be better. It's a call to be healthier in our relationships. It's a call to more. It's a call to stop hiding and to stop running, to stop and go back to the Father. I think some of us, we've been hiding, we've been hiding from God, we've been hiding from our spouse, we've been hiding from our boss. I think it's time for us to stop hiding and start living healthier and better lives that come through vulnerability, transparency, and connection. To let shame go. To live lives full of joy and peace. And lives not lived in hiding, but in the open. Where are you? Again, it might be a question God's asking us today is, where are you? Maybe you look and you're like, I, I don't even know where I am. I don't know where I'm at with my relationship with Jesus right now. I, I'm figuring it out. I'm on the fence. I'm not sure. Where are you? You might be in the place like you're saying about earlier. When we say, meet me here again. It's not the first time. And it might not be the last time where you have to say, God, meet me here. God, I'm right here. Here I am. I'm going to be here again and again and again, but every single time he will come back. He will meet you wherever you are. And what we're going to do is we're going to close our service by singing that song again, uh, here again. And I want to encourage you to stand or sit. And we're going to sing uh, this song, and I want to encourage you to stand, again, stand or sit, but sing it. Let these words speak to you that, that we're not enough unless he comes and he will meet us in that place and in that moment again. So Father, I thank you. The shame is gone in Jesus' name.
God, I pray that the things in our lives that we've been hiding in the darkness will come to light in Jesus' name. God, I pray that whether we're the ones to bring them to light or you are, God, I pray that they will come to light. God, I pray that you, you help us realize that you will come no matter what. You will meet us where we are no matter what. And God, today we come before you and we say, God, here we are. When you ask us the question, where are we? We say, God, here I am. God, let shame go in Jesus' name.